One of the main moral arguments the Christian church continues to use against those who identify as transgender is that it is sinful to alter or deny what God had made a person to be. Accordingly, this is the first argument that queer theologian Austin Hartke addresses in his pinnacle work, Transforming the Bible and the Lives of Transgender Christians. Reflecting on his own gender identity and faith, throughout his life he wrestled with the notion that God was somehow wrong, that God made a mistake when designing him. But after prayerful reflection and study of scripture, Harkey came to realize some valuable truths. For instance, he learned from Job that sometimes things happen in the world that just don't make any sense. He learned from Philip that sometimes you just have to say yes to God even when you have no idea what God is doing. He learned from Jesus that the post-resurrected body can be transformed, yet still retain its scars. And he learned from Abraham what it's like to have your name changed to reflect one's true identity. Ultimately, Hartke came to believe that God created him to be a transgender person in the world. I repeat, God made him transgender on purpose. In John chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples encounter a man who was born blind, and the disciples ask, whose sin, his own or his parents, was the reason he was born blind? Jesus responds, neither. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. It is true hubris to assume the blind man was a sinner all because he was different. Jesus explains that he was born blind in order to reveal God. That's right, not sin, but sign. The man was created blind in order to teach the world something. Yet, as the chapter continues, that message gets overshadowed by whether or not it was ethical for Jesus to heal him on the Sabbath, which was intended to be a day of rest. In his book, Harkey reminds us that God's laws were originally intended to organize the Israelites and that God breaks these rules all the time. This is first evident in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1. God separates day from night, yet that does not negate dusk and dawn. God separates land from sea, yet marshes remain. God is the Alpha and the Omega, but there are plenty of letters in between. Dualism reflects a spectrum, not a binary. It's not black and white. It's a rainbow. And Psalm 104 pays homage to this rainbow of diversity, rejoicing in the way God creates storks, rabbits, lions, and even sea monsters, and has given them each a home in their particular environment. And within this biodiversity, there are some plants and animals that switch back and forth between male and female. As there is evidence of homosexual and bisexual tendencies in all kinds of species, it's not a stretch to recognize the existence of transgender as well. Also, as is the case with intersex people, not everyone in all species are born male or female. God tells Job that there's no way he'll ever understand how creation works, so he just needs to stop questioning it. God breaks the rules all the time in the Bible, usually when demonstrating love. Deuteronomy 23 commands, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose penis is cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Well, that's an interesting directive from a people that perform genital mutilation in the form of circumcision. But nevertheless, by the time we get to Isaiah 56, the prophet states that those eunuchs and foreigners who join themselves to the Lord will be accepted in God's house of prayer. God changed God's mind. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm just laughing about that part that says the church will accept the outsider. <laughs> a, a sexually marginalized person, no less. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really happen these days. But more on that at the end of this lesson. The eunuch who Philip seeks out in Acts chapter 8 was a court official of the Queen of Ethiopia. Eunuchs were highly revered and trusted court officials serving kings and queens. They were considered perfect servants because they had no allegiance to family and could not jeopardize the dynastic lineage by having their own offspring. They were also able to move across gender and social boundaries and were often considered holy because of their perceived ability to access the spiritual realm. Or in other words, religion's outside the box. It's, it's out there, it's transcendent, right? So, as a queer person, if you're not bound by societal restraints like gender and sexuality, 
it was believed that you also weren't bound to this earth or material realms, that you have some sacred ability to recognize what most people cannot. And you want to know something? <laughs> I agree with that. Because my queerness has enabled me to think outside the box all the time. And that's a necessary tool for spiritual engagement. <laughs> and that's also what makes me an awesome religion teacher. Anyways, back, back to Philip. Philip overhears the eunuch reading from the book of Isaiah and asks if they understand what they're reading. The eunuch replies, how can I unless someone guides me? The passage he's reading is from Isaiah chapter 57, in which the servant is humiliated and denied justice. The eunuch invites Philip into their chariot, and Philip interprets the passage in light of the good news of Jesus. Philip helps the eunuch understand, and when they encounter water on their journey, the eunuch wants to be baptized as a Christian, and so Philip baptizes them. Philip then leaves, and the eunuch goes on their way full of joy. Note that we never learn the eunuch's name, the gender, the race, the class, or even the religion, but just their desire to be baptized and included. In Matthew 19, when talking about divorce, Jesus says that for some, it is better for a man not to take a wife, and affirmed the existence of eunuchs as positive examples to follow. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can't accept this should accept it. Eunuchs that have been made so by others or choose to live like a eunuch require no further explanation. It's the ones who were born that way that intrigues the scholars. Some have suggested that Jesus is actually referring to homosexuality or maybe even intersexuality or some broad category of people who from their birth have not fit in to the predominant expectations of gender and identity. As a matter of fact, the word eunuch was once used as a derogatory epithet applied to Jesus and his company for their renunciation of their masculinity. Here, Jesus could be reclaiming that word eunuch in the way the LGBT community has done so with the word queer. And note that unlike the blind, the leprous, the hemorrhaging, or even the dead, there is no reference to healing here. A eunuch was not someone that needed to be fixed in order to reintegrate into society. Instead, the eunuch is held up as a model to follow. To suggest a man go be like a eunuch would probably have been just as shocking as when Jesus commanded that the neighbor go be like that Samaritan. <laughs> Again, God breaks the rules all the time. Once damned, now the model! <laughs> the desire for God's kingdom can sometimes lead to an identity that falls outside the binary. When it comes to people who are different from you, focus on the love, not the judgment. Some queer theologians have suggested that prophet Daniel, who is described as having an eternal youth, may have been turned into a eunuch. When I first started doing research for this course, I came across Prophet Nehemiah, who admittedly I knew nothing about. But it turns out they may have been a eunuch as well, as they were once a Persian king's cupbearer. Making one a eunuch in ancient society included much more than just castration, but were identified by their dress, mannerisms, and even the food that they ate. Daniel chapter 1 indicated that the king of Babylon set out to make Daniel and his three friends eunuchs. Rabbinic tradition validates this claim, recognizing the Isaiah passage as justification for the allowance of eunuchs to participate in temple worship. Today, the Catholic Church reinforces a male and female binary, rejecting transgender and non-binary expressions as strictly sociological constructs. To support this claim, it appeals to a binary biology based in XX and XY chromosome distribution. Children are born either female or male, and claims that intersex or transgender persons are false expressions of sociological gender ideologies. But... Medicine and psychology contradict these claims. In 2017, the American Medical Association stated that gender is incompletely understood as a binary selection. 
This is important to know because Pope John Paul II in the 80s and 90s called for an intense dialogue between faith and science. Further, for over a millennium, Catholic canon law regarded intersex people as valid and existing, as hermaphrodites to be regarded in tracts on marriage and ordination, as female or male depending upon predominant characteristics. Even St. Augustine, who you know I got a love-hate relationship going on with, acknowledged the existence of intersex people and pushed the readers to welcome these rare individuals to the human family as deliberately fashioned by God and contributing to the overall beauty of creation. Now again, I don't claim to be an expert on being transgender, but what I know from religion is that revelation is always a process. Take the Trinity, for example, as explained by theologian St. Gregory of Nazianzus. The Old Testament proclaimed the Father clearly, but the Son more obscurely. The New Testament revealed the Son and gave us a glimpse of the divinity of the Spirit. Now the Spirit dwells among us and grants us a clearer vision of Himself. It was not prudent when the divinity of the Father had not yet been confessed to proclaim the Son openly, and when the divinity of the Son was not yet admitted to add the Holy Spirit as an extra burden, to speak somewhat daringly. By advancing and progressing from glory to glory, the light of the Trinity will shine in ever more brilliant rays. In short, the revelation of the persons of the Trinity was gradual and progressive, and God continues to reveal God's self throughout creation. For creation is a process, conception is a process, and perhaps sexual and gender identity are too. If the sin associated with being transgender has anything to do with surgically altering what God has made you to be, what makes a nose job morally acceptable? Or even a kidney transplant? What defines a person? Chromosomes? Genetics? Genitalia? Or is it their soul? Throughout the Bible, God changes names to reflect a new identity. God doesn't change their identity, though. That new name simply recognizes the identity that God has always known. So call them by their name.